don't make that step, if we don't start reducing some of the obstacles to get to treatment, to get to support, then all we're doing is making abuse inevitable. We're making a really bad situation worse. Hello, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights, and CSA Prevention. My name's Jeremy Malcolm, and this month I'm going to be talking to two special experts in child sexual abuse prevention, Dr. Gillian Tenbergen from the State University of New York at Oswego, and Candace Christiansen, who runs the Global Prevention Project. Well, welcome, and uh, thank you very much, both of you, for joining me today. So I'm very excited about this new initiative of yours. Uh, Dr. Tenbergen, how about you start and uh, give us a little bit of background about how this initiative came together? Um, yes, so at least from my perspective, I'm now working together with um, the Global Prevention Project and Candace Christiansen in particular on expanding um, access to primary prevention for child sexual abuse to New York State. So that's kind of a fancy way of, of saying that the treatment paradigm that she offers um, is going to be expanded outside of Salt Lake City into uh, into New York and part of that is going to be replicating it to make sure that it can be done that we can actually bring it um, outside of Utah and to um, verify its effectiveness and to see exactly how it's working um, in the end and we're going to do that over about two years time. Great well it's very exciting and we'll be going into some more detail about what's involved in the project uh, as we continue talking but uh, let me move over to Candace now um, and Candice, Gillian mentioned that you're based in Salt Lake City with your Global Prevention Project, but I guess the name Global indicates it's actually uh, a little bit bigger than that. Can you tell us more about your Global Prevention Project? Sure. It is definitely a global program. I think what specifically is global is our MAPS program, um, our, or what you know people refer to as MAP, Minor Attracted Person Program. We have a program for individuals to call in who needs support for their attraction, but also who needs support for depression, uh, stigma around their attraction, feeling isolated, alone, some call in and experience suicidality, some have a ton of shame, some have all of the above, some are struggling to, with an addiction to porn, some are struggling with viewing child pornography and need uh, us to support them and help them because they don't want to be viewing it. And so, you know, that is the program that's really made us globally known. We have different tracks within the Global Prevention Project, but really what we want to replicate is our MAP program, our, our program for minor attractive persons. And that's what we're excited to be doing with Dr. Tenbergen. There are some people that I suppose wouldn't come forward to, uh, to obtain help from this program because uh, they are situational uh, offenders who... Um, maybe have different problems, is, is that true? So our, our individuals who are legally involved because they were situational offenders go into our other, it's still through the Global Prevention Project, but it's, they go into that track, if you will. So they go into the legally involved track where we're providing sex offender treatment to them, you know, and just to kind of add on to, my purpose for doing this was because people were coming to me that weren't sex offenders. <laughs> You were sex offenders. I have a background in working with sex offenders. You know, I understand that track. I understand that treatment lane. But what do you do with this population that they're not sex offenders? You know, they've got the similar mental health issues and they also have this attraction. So, so correct. If someone comes to us and they say, you know, I have sexually offended or I'm legally involved because I'm being charged, then they go over to our, our offender track. That's just different than folks who are minor attracted. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more details about the program. But um, just before we get there, how do we know that this sort of prevention project can work? Um, I know you've had your own experience, Candice, with your program, but what about elsewhere in the world? Is there a precedent for this sort of prevention program actually being effective? Um, yes. I mean, this is certainly not the first attempt of, um, of trying to address child sexual abuse or try to address um, minor attraction from this perspective. There is one other program that exists in this, let's say in this modality, and that's the name the Prevention Project Dunkelfeld, um, which exists in Germany, where it's 
at least to my knowledge, the only other major treatment paradigm that exists that explicitly addresses pedophilia and hebophilia as it exists in the community. Now, that has actually been shown to be quite effective, at least the initial evidence that's coming out says it can work because when they were advertising their program in Germany over the first several years of its existence, it came out in 2009, um, actually it started really in 2005 and became popular and known in 2009 and later, there were several thousand call-ins saying that yes, not only can you reach these individuals, but yes, they're, they are looking for something that is, that is obviously not being provided. Um, and the first initial data to come out of the project says, yeah, we're doing something. We are actually making headway. We're helping um, in some way. And the Global Prevention Program is very similar insofar as we're addressing the same, the same group, only we're doing it in the U.S. where it's next to impossible. So um, there are several laws and several regulations that make Germany very different from the U.S. Um, in that regard. So that's, I think, the basis for what we're doing. But again, what Candace herself is offering does differ to an extent from what the PPD does. Sure, yeah, I'm happy to do that because I know that the MAPs that will be listening, at least the ones that are very adamant about being anti-contact and not offending definitely um, have a reaction when we talk about the prevention project Dunkelfeld. And I do think there are, um, you know, that's, Dunkelfeld definitely uh, blazed a trail in terms of, you know, offering the support to individuals who were in the dark field, if you will, um, those who have minor attractions that don't want to offend but need support as well as those who had um, and needed some support. What makes us different right now is our MAP program uh, treats individuals who are not coming to us saying, I've offended, I've sexually offended against someone. So that's a difference. It's a big difference. We have programs within the Global Prevention Project for individuals who are legally involved who have committed a sex crime. Our MAP program is for individuals right now who are coming to us saying, I am isolated, I am alone, I feel like I wanna kill myself, I am struggling with this stigma and this attraction, I have so much shame, I need to be able to talk to somebody. Now some individuals, as I mentioned, reach out and say, I am struggling with viewing child pornography, I'm addicted to porn, it's moved into this, I don't wanna be viewing this, and I don't know who I can talk to. I'm scared if I go to a regular therapist that they're going to call the police and assume that because I'm a pedophile or a hemophile that I'm an automatic child molester. And so what we're saying is we hear you and we're here for you. You know, we believe that, and, and some research has come out at the, the recent ATSA conference had some excellent researchers from the Netherlands, from the United Kingdom, Dr. Livesley and her team, Dr. Harper, um, you know, talked about how if we can help eliminate stigma and create support for minor attracted persons, it naturally, uh, naturally creates prevention. And so, we know that there's research that is out there that says if we are providing to su the support for minor attracted persons who are in need of mental health, again, support, um, not because they're child molesters, you know, pedophilia doesn't automatically equal uh, child molestation, um, but if we can help eliminate some of the stigma and decrease some of the shame, we naturally are providing prevention. So Dr. Tenbergen, do you want to add to that? Yes, just the idea that if the only thing we're addressing, if we advertise this or if we come off saying, oh, hey, we're here only for abuse prevention, that's only part of, that's only part of the equation. Again, as many psychologists and, and individuals who are trained in treatment provision are very fond of saying, desperate people do desperate things in desperate times. And that goes for many, many, many different diagnoses. So it, it stands to reason that let's start treating minor attracted individuals the same way we would treat other human beings. Mm -hmm. If we don't make that step, if we don't start reducing some of the obstacles to get to treatment, to get to support, then all we're doing is making 
of use inevitable. We're making a really bad situation worse. Um, so let's work on reducing that. And I think the biggest thing that we want to accomplish with this collaboration is simply how do you do that here in the U.S.? So remaining with you, Gillian, for a moment, um, you mentioned uh, some obstacles and some differences between the situation in the United States versus in Germany. Can you run us through some of those obstacles? The, well, the biggest difference, I'll say, between doing this work here and having worked together with the Dungefeld Project in Germany, now I was employed with a different project, um, that was considered, let's say, the research sister to the Dungefeld Project, but I worked very closely with um, the Dungefeld Project while I lived there for seven years. And what I can say is mandatory reporting is the big difference, and it's the one everybody talks about. Because in Germany, the, the, the social perspective is that if a person is already in treatment and they've established a rapport with a therapist, it's better that that person stay in therapy and be gaining the benefits of that treatment rather than destroying the, the therapeutic bond simply to take that person out and put them through the criminal justice system. So, excuse me, in Germany, the ther therapist client confidentiality is taken as seriously as in the US lawyer client confidentiality, where it cannot be broken unless there is sufficient level of detail now, a therapist is actually obligated by law in Germany to not break confidentiality unless they have an unknown individual that they can, unless they have enough detail to be able to make a report. Like they know who that child is, they know under what circumstances, et cetera, et cetera. Otherwise, it's meant to stay between the therapist and the client because that treatment is, is thought to outweigh the benefit of the criminal justice system. That's the biggest difference and also one of the largest obstacles to work with here in the US because again, depending on your jurisdiction, it's easy in Germany because they can open 11 clinics because mandatory reporting is the same throughout the country. What is the situation there when it comes to mandatory reporting of people uh, for viewing child sexual abuse imagery, uh, people who haven't uh, committed a, a hands-on offense but who maybe have viewed these illegal images? Are they required to be reported? With the way the law is structured in New York, now this is based on my own understanding after um, several different conversations with treatment providers, lawyers, and other um, legal personnel here in New York State. But I will give the caveat, I am not a lawyer, so I, everything, I can, everything I say from this point on is not legal advice. It is simply my understanding of the law. Um, and this will be built into um, anything we do offer here in New York, but my understanding so far is that if you are looking at indicative imagery or anything that is considered to be kind of this blanket term of child pornography does not fulfill the criteria for um, mandatory, for a mandatory, mandatorily reportable offense, let's say, here in New York State, because it does not contain a known victim, it does not contain um, information, like and identifiable information that would be required to make that report to the, to the state central registry. Um, it is still criminal behavior, but from a mandatory reporting perspective to prevent child sexual abuse, it does not fulfill those criteria, which means if you come into a clinic and you admit that, yes, I have looked at it, a treatment provider wouldn't be required to report you for child sexual abuse, but if anything were to be reported, it would be that you're looking at images because that is still a criminal offense. But because we're not looking at criminal activity in that sense, um, we can know that you're using it and still keep you in treatment. Now, if, if you were to ever face, you as in a, a, a client in this case, if they were to ever face um, judicial action. For example, if they were caught or if um, the police showed up and said, okay, listen, we have proof that you've been, you've been looking at this. Well, then that's the point at which we need to switch over to the criminal justice system. Um, but we would be, we would support the client in that process, but it would not come from us in that regard. So it provides us a bit of a, of a gray zone to be able to still intervene and offer services to an ever-growing group of individuals, um, 
before they just lapse into the criminal justice system. So let's turn back to, to Candace. Um, uh, now, Gillian's given a, a couple of obstacles that you've, you've faced in this project. One of them is the mandatory reporting and the other is the absence of funding. Is there anything else that you view as a challenge uh, to the success of this program? Well, I think, you know, I'm, maybe I'm just um, an optimist, so I really work hard to stay optimistic about all of this. I think, I think people, um, the media society in general, um, just needs to change. And so I think a challenge or obstacle, I know that we and Dr. Tenberg and I have experienced this on social media is, you know, just this automatic assumption that uh, we are pedo apologists, as she mentioned, and, you know, that we're just this idea that um, we're supporting pedophiles with the belief that pedophilia equals automatic child molester. And so, you know, I think for me, that's, I think, going to be just an obstacle that we face is can we get the global community on board uh, with our mission, vision, collaboration, that this is possible, you know, we, that, that helping human beings who have an attraction that they didn't choose, that are also facing grave stigma, shame, depression, that, you know, other individuals can go to a therapist with no question and get support for, can we offer this and have society accept it? I think that for me is going to be the biggest challenge. So, I, but I remain hopeful because, you know, I am a childhood sexual abuse survivor and I always talk about this. I cannot have my own children based on the trauma that was, I endured as an, an infant and young child to my body, the damage that was done. And so my plight is absolute prevention. And I had this population that has come to me who has said, I don't want to hurt anybody, but I need support. And so to me, it's the most logical thing in the world to have a program to offer individuals who did not choose this attraction, who need support to do so. And my prayer is, can we get society on board with that? That to me will be the biggest challenge. Um, why should we care um, about these stigmatized uh, individuals? A lot of people would have a sort of instinctive hatred towards them, um, even if they haven't offended, because the idea of, you know, thinking about minors in a sexual manner, to a lot of people that makes you a bad person. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, we're human beings first and um, individuals, cisgender, transgender, non-binary who come to us with an attraction to minors are adamant that they didn't choose. They didn't wake up one morning at 15 and say, I'm so excited. Today, instead of being attracted to this, you know, 15 year old, I'm going to be attracted to this five year old. You know, this isn't something that um, is wanted by uh, folks who identify as having a minor attraction, specifically pedophilia. And so, you know, that's my response. And that's a lot of uh, minor attracted persons response, especially on social media. It's like, okay, here's our, here's our response to you who are hating what we're doing. You know, this isn't something that's chosen. This is something that we were born with. And you know, there are biological underpinnings now that do show that, and there continues to be research on that, which is very, very exciting and hopeful. And so again, these are individuals coming forward to get help. Why wouldn't I help them just like anybody else? You know, they're coming to me, you know, a lot of the depression, like Gillian mentioned the you know, there might be substance abuse, there might be, um, suicidality, so on and so forth. And when we get to it, a lot of that can be the result of having this attraction and getting so much hate just for identifying with that. And so, you know, again, I believe as a licensed clinician that I have an ethical duty to treat folks who come to me asking for help. 
you know, if I have someone that needs mental health support, I'm not going to pick and choose who gets that support. And so because I have been open, I have um, been given this opportunity to be trusted by the MAP community globally. And I feel really honored by that. So, you know, Jeremy, that's my response. So uh, turning back to Gillian again, um, have you done any uh, outreach to the community uh, to, to gauge their response to your ideas and how well has this been received? Yes and no. Um, yes, insofar as I do try to talk about my work. Um, whenever anybody asks me what I do for a living, I usually include a pitch for the work that I do now, um, which says prevention through, um, through support, prevention through um, alternative means. And I usually start out any conversation whenever somebody asks me what I do for a living um, after I sort of give the lead in, oh, I do prevention work and I'm a researcher and psychologist. Um, I'll usually gauge my audience and then see whether or not they're, they're open to the more delicate, the more sensitive topic of um, child sexual abuse and prevention and pedophilia and so on. Um, and doesn't mean they are. Um, I'll usually ask them at some point the question, well, do you think we're doing enough right now? Or do you think we're successful at preventing child sexual abuse? And every single time I, I ask that question, I get no as a response, every single time. And my natural follow-up is, okay, well, what should we be doing differently? And more often than not, the response I get is, well, most of the prevention efforts now assume a victim before we intervene. So they're all criminal justice based, they're all after the fact. So when I interact with people on an individual level, the response I seem to get is, we acknowledge that there's a flaw in the system, we acknowledge that we need change. And when I'm asked to, to speak to groups on this, like I do teach for a living, so I do talk about this work in class, I do talk about what I do, students do support me in the work that I do. Um, I give lectures when I can outside of here and my outreach tends to say that yes, um, the public tends to be quite open to the idea. Um, but I think that there's still a lot of misinformation out there that we are having to fight against. And on that note, I am in the middle of actually collecting data in a study to assess community support for this type of work. Um, I hope to be actually publishing that data or collecting the data through next year and then publishing it shortly thereafter. Um, and the experience I've made so far suggests the community that individuals at large in society, we are experiencing a shift. Mm -hmm. Again, it'll take time before we're fully there, but I think in general, the support is there. And I, and I second Candace's opinion about being an optimist. Um, as cynical as I may get these days, I, I try to retain at least a shred of, of optimism. Uh, Gillian, what's your, um, what drove you to work in this controversial area? Was there some turning point or, um, you know, realization that this was an underserved area or, or what was it that drove you to work in this area? I've been, I've been thinking about that question for so long because it's one of the most common questions I'm asked is why do I do this? Um, but I think there really was no moment when I woke up and decided, oh, I was gonna go into pedophilia research or, um, you know, I was, I, I, I never had that really, that, that moment. Um, but I, I was granted an opportunity when I was pursuing my PhD in Germany to work with an absolutely fantastic group of individuals. Um, who deserve all the credit that they're getting because they are the, the largest research group to exist these, um, yet that does research specifically into the causes of, pe of pedophilia. Um, and it was through that experience in Germany where I had a lot of my misconceptions having grown up in the US sort of shattered that I decided this is actually a viable research field. This is actually something I wouldn't mind doing for the rest of my life. And when I then moved with my husband back to the U.S. and realized, wow, there's nobody doing this in the U.S., 
I think that was really the, the set of moments that, that showed me, okay, um, I'd like to continue doing this. It, it feels like the right thing to be doing. Um, I don't have any personal history in this, but it feels like, why do I do this? Because it's the right thing to do. Because one of the, one of the worldviews I live by is I want to do the right thing, not the easy thing. And generally speaking, if it's the right thing to do, it's probably not easy to do. And for anybody who does know me, um, once you do get to know me, you tend to figure out that controversy follows me. Um, I like getting my, I, I like getting into things that are controversial, mainly because that's usually where good work needs to be done. Um, if it's controversial, it's because somebody made it that way. Why? Why is it controversial? Great. Well, um, I'm going to just uh, wrap up with a couple more questions to both of you. And let's turn back to Candice again. So uh, if you could identify one thing that you would change about the way that our society confronts the problem of child sexual abuse, what would it be? One thing. To not automatically assume that every single person that molests a child is an automatic pedophile. So I, there are so many more reasons why somebody might um, harm a child. So that would be the one thing. Yep. Uh, so exactly the same question to you, Gillian. What would you uh, change about the way that our society confronts this problem if you could change one thing? I think what I'd like to see over, over the long term is just a, a shift in funding priorities. So making this type of research not the kind of research that takes place in somebody's, you know, kind of basement lab in the corner that no one ever talks about, but bringing it out into the public by saying it's okay to do this kind of research. It's okay to sponsor these types of programs that we are trying to do this, this good thing. We're all in the same game together. We're all trying to prevent child sexual abuse from, um, because the individuals, the non-offending individuals I've spoken to, that's, that's what they believe in at their core. Um, and they're in the same boat that we are trying to just address this from another thing. So I think the one thing I would change is let's get those voices heard. Let's make them louder. Let's say we're all in this together. We're all trying to meet the same goal, but we need to do it from multiple different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way we're ever going to actually address this, this issue across the board. Well, uh, it's very exciting, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck. Uh, how can people find out more about your plans? We're going to slowly un uh, reveal, if you will, in the new year what's going on, but it's just we're right at the beginning of it. And so um, Twitter right now, you'll see us communicating, and then I would say probably spring or summer of next year, don't you think, Gillian? Maybe people will hear more about what we're doing. Yeah. So. Twitter is a good way to hear about it. Um, yeah. I will be updating my own personal website soon to include um, the research projects that I have going on with this, um, just so that individuals can learn more about the research questions that we're asking and find out ways to participate if they're interested. Um, and publications will be forthcoming. We have have a few that are um, that are in the pipeline now, so. The general public will be hearing more about this um, over the course of the next several months, I think. Yeah. And we'll, pu we'll put it on the globalpreventionproject.org as well. We'll be taking Gillian's lead on that as well. Great. Well, I'll be also including links to your Twitter profiles and your websites uh, in this podcast and vodcast. So uh, thank you very much. It's, as I said, been very exciting to hear from you about your plans. Uh, best of luck and, uh, and thanks very much for chatting with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. We'll be back again next month, so please make sure to subscribe to this podcast, or if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to click right here for a button to subscribe to our channel. Please also consider donating to support our work. Thanks again for watching, and bye-bye for now.